17. And if you're able this morning, will you stand for the reading of God's Word? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is God's word. You may be seated. And so I, I want to start off this morning by, by saying that if you're here this morning and, and you're not yet a follower of Christ, if you're not yet a Christian, I, I just want to echo what the Apostle Paul just wrote when he said, we implore you, be reconciled to God. Now, now maybe this concept of you needing to be reconciled to God might seem foreign but, to you because you've grown up in a world where you've been told all your life, well, you're okay, you're fine, you're great, you can do anything that you want to do or set your mind to. If anything's wrong, it's something wrong with the rest of the world. But that's not what the Bible informs us. The Bible informs us that, that we have a brokenness inside of us. It's called sin. And, and that God has made a way by which that brokenness can be remedied, it can be healed, and it's through the person of Christ who came and did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He, he led a perfect life that we have not lived he died a death on our behalf, taking the punishment for our sin, on the cross, and he rose from the dead, conquering death. And so, God is holy, we are not. That's what the Bible tells us. We, we might be better than some of our neighbors, sure, but, but we pale in comparison to God. And yet God has made a way by which that rift can be bridged in the person of Christ. So, so we implore you, be reconciled to God. If you are united to Christ by faith, in other words, if, if, if you trust in what Christ has done for you, the Bible, as we just read in verse 17, says, you are a new creation. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. So, you want to be made new? It's, it's not by drinking diet shakes. It's not by going to the plastic surgeon. It's not by working out. It's not by going to some health self Help, guru, to, to get your mind straight. You want to be made new? Place your faith in Christ. Be found in Him. And you'll become a new creation. The one who made you in the first place is the one who can renew you. And so the way we're reconciled to God, it's, it's not by following some set of rules. It's trusting and delighting and resting in what Christ has done for you. The Gospel of John tells us in John chapter 6, 28, some, some people had come up to Christ and said, what must we do to perform the works of God? And Jesus replied, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. And we'll talk about more about what that belief looks like in, in weeks ahead. But central, at the core of the Christian faith, it's not what we do, but rather something that has been done for us. And, and the cross is a, a reminder of that. And, and the reason the cross is so central to the Christian faith is because we understand that 2,000 years ago, outside of Jerusalem, on the cross of Christ, something unique took place in time and space. There was a divine exchange where Christ took the penalty for my sin, and I received his righteousness. It's, it's what theologians call double imputation. Say it with me. Double imputation. So it's the idea that Christ takes my sin and I receive his righteousness. Now, to illustrate this, I'm going to embarrass myself. Um, but I'm willing to embarrass myself. 
in order to get a theological truth um, sunk into your mind. Okay, so um, I own this jacket. Um, this is the embarrassing part. Okay, it's a red corduroy jacket and lined. I mean, I. Um, I bought this because it was $4.97 when Steinmart had their 90% off sale. Okay, so four bucks ninety-seven. It's been in my closet for about three years. And uh, here, Mason, I'm going to let you put this on. Uh, that's Mason's Letterman jacket. So I, I, I want to take. So um, I, I bought this jacket. Like I said, this is the first time I've actually worn it in public, but it was such a good deal. <laughs> I just had to get it. Um, well, good. I'm glad some of you like it. So, but I, I want us to go back to high school. So some, some of you are, are young enough to remember high school. And I want you to imagine that I showed up at high school wearing this jacket. Yeah, Miss, Miss Norma, who's in her 90s, she, she's shaking her head. Yeah, don't do that. That's a bad idea. You show up to high school wearing this jacket, you're going to be ostracized. You're going to be made fun of. You're going to be the person, they see you walking down the hall, and they turn around because they don't want to talk to you or be associated with you. They don't want you talking to them. This, this is the nerd alert jacket, right? This is the jacket you wear to high school, and it goes down in infamy. Remember that time that dude wore that red corduroy blazer to high school? School, what the heck was he thinking? So I wear this jacket to high school, and my social status on a scale of 100 is like a, a half, right? I'm persona non grata. I am, I am excluded from the, the, the school group chats. They don't even send me the, the school emails to let me know about the things going on at school, lest I show up in this jacket. Now contrast that with Mason. Mason's a football player. Mason, Mason lettered in football. Mason plays both ways. So, so Mason, in, or during the football game, he, he goes after the opposing team's quarterback to sack them. And, and when our team has the ball, he protects the quarterback. Mason's the guy who, when the, he walks down the hall, smile, Mason. Okay, there. When he walks down the hall, everybody says, hey, it's Mason. Great game last night, Mason. Hey, Mason, we got a party coming up Friday night. People are texting Mason. Mason's phones lighten up because people, people want to hang around Mason. Mason is in the know on, on that social status of, at high school where I'm at half a, half a point. He's at 99 points, okay? The only guy at 100 is the quarterback. But after him... Mason's the cool guy. He's the one everyone wants to hang out with. Then one day, Mason commits social suicide at school. And when I say social suicide, it's he sees me and he comes up to me and he says, Robert, take your jacket off. So I take my jacket off. And Mason takes his jacket off, and then he puts on my jacket, and I put on Mason's jacket. Now, all of a sudden, I'm walking down the highway, uh, down the hallway, and people are like, hey, nice Letterman jacket. You play football? Want to come to our party? And then they see Mason coming in that smashing red corduroy blazer. <laughs> And they turn and they run, right? Everybody, Mason stayed late to help be this illustration. Everybody give Mason a round of applause. Okay, I, I, I use this illustration to give you a picture, thanks Mace, of what Christ has done for us. We, we are... The nerds, right? We're, we're the ones with the corduroy blazer. Our, our status before God is, is zippity doo -dah. And Christ takes on himself the punishment we justly deserve. But, and we receive not only forgiveness, in other words, our blazer isn't just taken off us, we receive Christ's righteousness. His righteousness is imputed to us. So there's this divine exchange that takes place. What, that we read about, that we just read in first, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. God made him who had no sin, 
Christ to be sin for us. So that in Him, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. Charles Hodge puts it this way. He says, there's probably no passage in the Scripture, commenting on 2 Corinthians 5.21, in which the doctrine of justification is more consciously or clearly stated than this one. Our sins were imputed to Christ and His righteousness is imputed to us. He bore our sins. We are clothed in His righteousness. Christ bearing our sins did not make Him morally a sinner, nor does Christ's righteousness become subjectively ours. It's not the moral quality of our souls. Our sins were the judicial ground of the sufferings of Christ, so that they were the satisfaction of justice. And His, Christ's righteousness, is the judicial ground of our acceptance with God. So Christ bore the punishment for the sins of His people. And this morning I want us to ponder those two aspects of what I just call this divine exchange. Our sins forgiven, Christ's righteousness imputed to us. And so let's read together as, as we continue our study through the New City Catechism. Question number 25, and you'll find it at the bottom of this morning's sermon outline. If you'll read the answer with me, I'll, I'll read the question aloud. Does Christ's death mean all our sins can be forgiven? Yes, because Christ's death on the cross fully paid the penalty for our sin, God graciously imputes Christ's righteousness to us as if it were our own and will remember our sin no more. Now, a, a side note here. You, you notice in this morning's outline I wrote, Christ fully paid for the sins of his people. And, and I want us to focus a little bit on this idea of him paying for the sins of his people because I used the same kind of language last week. If, if you missed last Sunday's message, it's available online. You can, you can watch it. Uh, just go to our website, click sermons, go down to the most recent one. It's, it's there and you, you can, can watch the whole thing. But I, I want to focus particularly on this idea of Christ fully paying for the sins of his people because... Last week, I used the same kind of language, and someone essentially asked me, well, why didn't you say he paid for the sins of the whole world? Why, why did you do the language, his people? There's a sense in which Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. He, he dies for, for people all around the world, of every ethnic group, every tribe, every social status, and, and gender. And so, the quality and the value of Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient for the whole world. By, by that I mean, if every person on the planet who ever lived repented of their sin and trusted in Christ, his sacrifice was still big enough to cover their sin. But not every person on the planet does turn from their sin, do they? Not every person on the planet will turn from their sin. And so in that sense, Jesus' atonement is limited to those who place their faith in him. So that's why I wrote, he dies for the sin of his people. I, I didn't want to use, he died for the sins of the world, lest you think that, well, the price has been paid for everybody, then everybody has to go to heaven. If, if the debt for sin has been paid, it would be unjust for God to demand payment from everyone. If Christ paid for every individual person's sin on the cross, God would be unjust to send anyone to hell to pay for their own sin. Now, now, some call this the doctrine of limited atonement. I, I don't like that term. I think effectual atonement or definite atonement conveys the idea better. But the other reason I, I, I chose to say Christ died for his people is because when, when we look at Scripture, there are certain places in God's Word where it indicates that, 
that Jesus died for our, a particular people. So for example, if you read the whole Gospel of Mark, beginning to end, you'll only find one place in it where it tells us why Jesus came. It's in John chapter 10, I think it's verse 45. Jesus said, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. It doesn't say give his life as a ransom for everyone. It says give his life as a ransom for many. In John chapter 17, verse 9, Jesus is praying in the upper room. He says, I, I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. Now, again, this is a sidebar. This isn't what the main thrust of the, the message is, and, and we'll, we'll talk about these ideas a little bit more in, in the weeks that follow. That said, we don't know whose sin Christ paid for or not. I, I, I wish, you know how we have metal detectors at airports and stadiums? I wish we had that kind of thing at the front door, and, and there, was, there was a green light and a red light, and... Um, you walk through, and if Jesus had paid for your sins, it turns green, and you can sit on this side. If he hadn't, it turns red. He can sit here, right? Um, that, that, that's not how it works. And so, and so this doesn't change the way we evangelize. We go and we tell, Jesus died. He, he died to make a way by which men could be reconciled to God. And, and if you place your faith in him, if you trust in him, if, if you turn from your own self-salvation schemes, if you turn to Christ, if, if you repent from your sin and turn to him, you, all your sins are forgiven. We preach the good news that, that Jesus has made a way by which those to come to him in faith will find salvation and all their sin will be forgiven. There are those in our day and age who preach that in the end, everybody goes to heaven. And yet, the Bible says, Jesus says, narrow is the road that leads to eternal life. And there are few who find it. Large is the highway that leads to, broad is the highway that leads to destruction. And there are many who are on it. But for those of us who have been found in Christ, for, for those of us who are Christians, who, those of us who've been given eternal life, those of us who are new creations, we have confidence that all of our sins are paid. All of them. Just think about the songs we just sang. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Grace that is greater than some of our sin? No, grace that is greater than all of our sin. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part, but in whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord of my soul. All of them, each and every one of your sins has been taken care of on the cross of Christ. If you're found in Christ. If, if you're walking around wearing the letterman's jacket, all of your sins are taken care of. I, I used to think when I was a kid, I, I used to think that, that salvation was kind of like, a, a, how, how many of you play golf? Anybody raise your hand? And anybody ever play golf? Okay, Sean plays golf. Okay. Anybody need a partner to play golf? Sean will work for green fees. Um, there's, there's a term in golf called a mulligan. Which so it, it's a term for when you, you get up and, and you tee off and and you hit the ball very poorly, and the ball might slice or hook. Say, say it goes this way and it's down some canyon in the mouth of of some bobcat. Right? How are you going to hit that ball? So so the person you're with says, "I'm going to give you a mulligan," which means it's a do-over. And some people think that that's all Christianity is that. That, that, that you've got to kind of come correct to God once and say, hey, I need a do-over, and then the rest is up to you. No, God says His mercies are new every morning. New each and every morning. Martin Luther said all of the Christian life is repentance, and, and that means a constant coming to God and, and, and asking 
and, and turning from your own ways and turning to God. Christianity, the gospel, is not about getting a mulligan. The gospel is about resting and trusting in what Christ has done for us once for all. So, uh, I want you to turn with me to the book of Colossians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. It's going to be to your right. If you're using a pew Bible, again, um, page 834. It reads as follows. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. Well, let, let me just give you a little bit of background. There's some people who are coming into the church who are saying, okay, you're Christians now, that's great, but in order to really be Christians, you have to be circumcised. You've got to be Jewish like us. And for many reasons, there are certain people having problems with that. <laughs> and so Paul writes to address this issue, and he basically says, no, 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 no. The circumcision was a shadow of things to come. In fact, he writes in verse 11, in Christ, in him, you were also circumcised in the putting off of your sinful nature. So just as circumcision is the cutting of the foreskin, the, the, the circumcision of the heart is the cutting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with a circumcision done by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, and raised with him through faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead, verse 13, in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all our sins. Having canceled the written code with its regulations, that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part, but the whole, was nailed to the cross. And I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord on my soul. We, Jesus does it all. He says it is finished. He doesn't say it's mostly done. Try to do a good job with what I've given you. We, we don't even get to leave the tip. How, how many of you have been out to like a nice fancy dinner? Somebody takes you out and, and, and it's really fancy and it's so fancy that you almost feel guilty because you ordered like a $60 steak? And, and, and this person just wants to be kind and generous, but when the bill comes, you say, oh, well, let me leave the tip. That, that's not how the gospel works. There, there are people who see Christianity like that, that, that God pays for the meal, if you would, the, the, the essential part of it, but then we kind of cover the extra, we kind of cover the service charge. God covers most of the offense, but then we take care of the rest of the offense through our service to the church or through the church. No, we sing boldly and gladly and confidently that Jesus paid it all. In fact, in response to this kind of thinking that we add to our salvation, Jonathan Edwards wrote, the only thing you contribute to your salvation is the sin that made it necessary. The only thing you contribute to your salvation is the sin that made it necessary. And, and, and so when you understand God's grace that way, what does that do to your heart? You say, oh my, my God! Have, have you really shown this kind of generosity to me? Have you really shown this kind of mercy to me? So that None of our sins are held against us. The, the catechism question, and, and if I were, would have written it, I would have perhaps written it differently. It, it says, God righteously imputes Christ's righteousness to us as if it were our own, and will remember our sins no more. It, it, this language of remembering our sins no more, I, I understand why it says that, because that's the language the Bible uses. In, in Hebrews 8.12, it quotes from Isaiah it says, I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. 
I, there's, there's some people who, when they read that verse, think that God forgets. That somehow God is no longer omniscient. So that God knows everything in the world except your sins. But you do. So there are a whole bunch of people walking around this earth who knows things God doesn't know. No. Uh, this, this is accounting language. The, the idea is that there's no debt for this that's going to have to be paid. The, the, the debt isn't remembered. It's not counted against you. The ledger has been wiped clear. God isn't selectively omniscient and forgetful. No, he, he knows our sin, but he does not. It's not charged against us. Our sins will not be held against us. And, and the reason God remembers our sins no more is because, again, we have been clothed in the righteousness of Christ. His righteousness is imputed to us. How many sins did Jesus commit? Say none. And so when God looks at us and he sees us robed in Christ's righteousness, he sees all of Christ's sins, which are none. And, and this brings us to the next point I want to focus on. We've, we've talked about how Christ fully paid for the sins of his people. Now I want to talk about this idea of Christ's righteousness being imputed to us. Now, um, some of you know what imputation means. Not amputation, okay? Amputation means to have something cut off. Imputation means to have something attributed to you, if you would. So, the way we might use that language is, how, how many of you were watching the World Cup? Okay, so yesterday, yesterday there was a game between um, Mexico and Korea, and Yang Yun Su was penalized for a handball against Mexico. And, and if you saw the play, you know that it wasn't really his fault. A, a guy was getting ready to shoot, and he kind of dove down, and when the guy kicked, he kicked right into his arm. Ref calls handball, penalty kick, and they got a penalty shot, and Mexico converted. And so I think it'd be appropriate to say, you can't impute all the blame for Korea's loss on Yang Hyun So. It, it, it's not all his fault. That's, that's how we use the word impute. But if, if you have a hard time with the word impute, think attribute. Okay? So, Christ's righteousness, his goodness, his merit, his, his perfect obedience to the law, his always loving his neighbor as himself, is attributed to us. Again, back to the, that passage we started off with in 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Again, this, this picture of this wonderful exchange. God made him, Christ, who had no sin to be sin for us. He takes our red coat so that in him we might take his letterman's jacket. In him we might become the righteousness of God. So, so this is what theologians call an alien righteousness. It's a righteousness that, that we don't conjure up. It's a righteousness that's attributed to us in Christ. Now, th this is a beautiful concept that's found all throughout the scriptures, but especially in, in Romans 3 and 4. Um, God doesn't save us and then say, okay, I'm going to give you this toolbox and everything in this toolbox is, is all you need for your salvation. Do your best, work hard, I'm sure you'll figure it out. No! The Bible informs us that our own righteousness is like filthy rags. But when we trust in the perfect sacrifice and the perfect righteousness of Christ, we are reckoned, we are counted as righteous. And, and this gets back to this idea of double imputation. We, we don't just get rid of our sin, get rid of the nerd jacket. We're now wearing the letterman's jacket. When some of you might know, know the name John Bunyan. No relation to Paul Bunyan. Okay, John, John Bunyan was the author of the, the second greatest bestseller in English history. It's called The Pilgrim's Progress. Okay. And, and he was a preacher, Baptist preacher, lived hundreds of years ago. But, but he recounts in his book, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, he, he recounts 
how he started grasping this concept that his righteousness was found in Christ and not himself. He, he writes, one day I was passing into the field. This sentence fell upon my soul. Thy righteousness is in heaven. And methought withal, I saw with the eyes of my soul, Jesus Christ at God's right hand, there, I say, was my righteousness. So that wherever I was or whatever I was doing, God could not say of me, he lacks my righteousness, for that was just in front of him. I also saw, moreover, that it was not my good frame of heart that made my righteousness better, nor yet my bad frame that made my righteousness worse, for my righteousness was Jesus Christ himself, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now did my chains fall off my legs indeed. I was loosed from my afflictions and my irons. My temptations also fled away. So that from that time, those dreadful scriptures of God left off to, to trouble me. Now went I also home rejoicing for the grace and love of God. He had been wrestling with Passages he'd seen in Scripture and recognizing that he was not righteous. And yet righteousness is what God demands. But righteousness is also what God gives us in Christ. So he, he ran home and searched the Scripture because he wanted to make sure this just wasn't some crazy idea off the top of his head. He, he wanted to make sure it was rooted in God's Word. And he came across 1 Corinthians 1.30 that reads as follows. It was because of him, because of God, that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, our holiness, and redemption. By this scripture, Bunyan said, I saw that the man Christ Jesus is our righteousness and sanctification before God. Here, therefore, I lived for some time very sweetly at peace with God, through Christ. Because he, he got it. He understood that, that it wasn't just a matter of God getting rid of his sin. And him trying really hard to be righteous because all that led to was the recognition of how unrighteous he was. He recognized he needed an alien righteousness, a righteousness from outside of his self, a righteousness found at the right hand of God the Father, a righteousness found in Christ. Again, what did we read in, first, in 2 Corinthians 5.21? God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let me give you one more analogy that might help drive this idea home. Again, when we preach, when we share the, God's, God's word, oftentimes we talk about how God forgives us from, for our sins in Christ. When we place our faith and trust in Christ's sacrifice, we're forgiven from our sin, and rightfully so. And, and we often liken it to having a debt being canceled. So, so imagine, imagine you have first and second on your house. You're, you're making the monthly payment, but you're barely scraping by. And then you've got about $400,000 in credit card debt. Interest rates are going up and, and you know this just isn't sustainable. It's not going to last. You owe so much money. And then someone comes along and pays your debt. Pays those $400,000. Pays what you owe on your house. No more mortgage payment. No, no more debt. And, and we talk about that as an analogy for how God forgives us our sin. But God has done more than just forgive us our sin. He, he's also placed $100 million in our bank account. That's what we have in Christ's righteousness. It's, it, it, it'd be like, uh, imagine, imagine you're an orphan in, in, during the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in London. So, so you're an orphan and, and you're a street urchin and you're running around and, and the way you're sustaining yourself is by stealing. Because you've got to eat and you're caught and you're thrown into a workhouse. And, and there's no way you, you can pay off your, your debt. And then all of a sudden one day the warden comes and opens up the door and he says, hey, somebody, 
paid your debt for you. So you're free. That's awesome. No more workouts. I'm free. But what's this orphan free to do? How's he going to sustain himself? So he, he, he comes out of the workhouse and, and there's a carriage that pulls up. Fancy carriage. And, and it's, it's one of the richest men in all of London. In fact, the richest man in all of London. And the carriage door opens and he says, why, why don't you come in here for a minute, son? You, you come in and, and he says, I've, I've got great riches. I, I, I want to share them with you. I, I don't want to just share them with you. I want to adopt you because I know you don't have parents of your own. And I want you to be mine. And one day, you'll, you'll be the heir to, to my riches. What, what do you think the orphan's going to do? I, I, I think he's, he's going to start by saying, Yes! And then he's probably going to cry because he, he didn't have hope. I mean, the only hope he had was to get out of jail. What, what's he going to do with his freedom? That's what Christ does for us. He doesn't just forgive us of our sin. We're not just forgiven of our sin because of Christ, but Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. It's attributed to us. My wife Amy was sitting down with a, a young woman The, the friends of our family. And, but not believers, not followers of Christ. And, and as she was talking to this, this young woman, the, the topic of Christianity came up. And, and Amy s said something along these lines. She said, what, what is it that's preventing you from becoming a Christian? And the response by this woman was, it's just too good to be true. And Amy didn't really know how to respond after that because she knew that this woman at least understood the gospel. But because when you really understand, when, when, when you understand, when you understand what your maker has done for you? Look, look we, we are rebels all. We, we were made by God and for God to glorify God, and yet we, we don't. We live for ourselves. And yet God in His mercy has, has made a way by which a sinner like me can come to Him. almost too good to be true. It's, it's almost too much. It's, it's miraculous that, that, that I could be loved like this. You might be sitting there and say, well, Pastor Robert, you're not so bad. You're a really nice guy. You're, you're not that hard to love. You don't see me like God sees me. And, and what I mean is you, you don't know my thoughts and the wickedness of my heart. And yet, even while I was dead in my trespasses and sins, God rescued me. And that rescue is available to all who will come to Him. All who will turn from their sin, from their self salvation schemes, and turn to Christ in faith. They can be overwhelmed with the riches of God's grace and love. Would, would you bow your heads and pray with me? Lord, I, I, I think of Amy's friend who thought it was too good to be true. And, and I suspect that there may be people here this morning who think the salvation that you offer is too good to be true. 
when they start really thinking about it. When, when they start understanding that it's not just forgiveness of sin, it's righteousness in Christ, it's being adopted in the family of God, it, it almost sounds like a fairy tale. Full of miracles. The blind seeing, the lame walking, the hungry fed, the dead rising. And yet, Lord, it's not a fairy tale. Oh, it's a tall tale, but it is not a fairy tale. It is rooted and grounded in history. And so my prayer this morning is for any who, who are here who might be on the brink. Lord, even now, would you be at work in their heart? Would you grant them the gift of faith that they might come to know you and love you and treasure you and delight in you and see you for all that you are and all that you've done? May they be reconciled to you. Even this morning we pray. And Lord, for, for those of us who, who are counted uh, among those, those for whom Christ has died, we know we're His. We know our sins are forgiven. We, we've been called out of darkness and into His marvelous light. Lord, may we live in that reality. May that truth be evident to us. May this doctrine be precious to us as it was to John Bunyan. And may we boldly proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may he lift up the light of his counts upon you. And give you his peace as you go in his grace. Coffee and donuts in the back. Tuesday night, movie night on the lawn. And uh, if we don't see you then, Lord willing, we will see you next Sunday. The rest of the announcements are in your bulletin. God bless and have a wonderful week.